Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9. We're going to continue our study there. And I wanted to ask you, have you ever considered that we often think that in order for our life to be significant, there must be this busyness and turbulency in our life. It must be like this uncommon thing that we do, uncommon, very significant to make our life significant. Something remarkable, exceptional, something unusual, and not just something. We often think that there must be lots and lots of it, lots of those remarkable, exceptional, unusual things that we do in order to make our life significant. Sometimes we actually find ourselves in a state of this frantic effort. Too much to do. Always too much to do. To a point that sometimes we commit violence to our own souls because we are in such a state. This is why the words of Paul in this text are so shocking and so much needed for us today. He says in verse 11, these very interesting words, aspire to live a quiet life. What amazingly shocking words, especially for the culture that we are part of. It goes against the flow of everything that we do, a culture of hurry, frantic activity, pursuit of something uncommon. Really, it's really a pursuit of significance through all of that. Paul says, aspire to live quietly. Now, what Paul is saying here is that loving people through a quiet and diligent life is the most significant way to live. And that's what we're going to look at this, this morning as we look through this text. He says, a quiet or a, the way to live, a loving people through a quiet and diligent life is the most significant way to live. So it is not just a quiet life that he's calling the Thessalonians to live, but a quiet life that diligently loves other people. So let's read from verse 9 through verse 12. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. We're going to look at three things today that have to do with this quiet life that Paul is talking about. Three observations, in fact, about this quiet life that he is calling them to live. First is love that keeps on giving, quietness that comes from within, and work that is valuable before God. Three things. Now, as we, as we look through this text, remember that our job is not just to understand what this text meant, to the original recipients. It's not enough for us to say, now we know what Paul meant when he wrote to them, to the Thessalonians back in the day. We must go a step further. The meaning of that you can just derive by reading a commentary. Our goal is to go a step further, to finish the job and to say, what is the significance of this text to our life, to our day, to what we do because the issues and heart problems that were faced by Thessalonians in that day are the same issues and the same problems that we face in our day. So as we look through this text, don't just look and think of what Thessalonians should have been doing or should be doing, but what we should be doing, how we should live. So three things about quiet life that we can make observations about. And the first one, love that keeps on giving. Love that keeps on giving. Before we go into the detail of that, let's 
Let's first look that Paul is calling them to life. He's, the question is, what, does it, what makes our life significant? That, that's the question we're asking. What, is, what gives meaning to our life? And Paul here starts with love. Uh, in verse 9, he says, Concerning brotherly love, you have no need for, you, uh, for anyone to write to you. But let's, let's just take a step back. Let's look at the flow of this letter. And let's... Let's see what is happening here. So Paul is writing to a new church, a church that faced persecution, a church that is doing well. Timothy comes back and brings a good report. Paul is happy, and he is excited for the work that God is doing in that church. And yet at the same time, there's something that we can pick up on as Paul is giving them these instructions. If you were a... uh, a detective reading through this text, he would detect certain things that Paul is saying that perhaps give us a glimpse of what may be happening with these believers there that are generally doing very good. Uh, This is why uh, Paul is saying to them, I want you to love through aspiring for a quiet life, to mind your own business. Paul seems to be addressing some kind of busyness, an activity that is not helpful to the Christian life. That's why he's calling them to this. Quiet life, work with your hands, mind your own affairs. There's almost like there's maybe someone or some of them were busy with all kinds of things that were just not what God wanted them to do, not what God called them to. This is why Paul says, mind your own affairs. Now in In chapter 5 of this letter, chapter 5, verse 14, Paul uses a certain word, and he says, we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle. So there is somebody who is idle there, which, which if you translate more accurately, it would be someone who is disorderly or someone who is undisciplined. In fact, ESV makes a footnote with that, these exact uh, words, disorderly or undisciplined. Uh, this is what Paul is referring to. So it's not a person who is necessarily sitting and doing nothing, but a person who instead is full of all kinds of activity. They are busy doing all kinds of things, extremely busy with activity, but busy with the wrong things. This is very important to understand. Paul uses the same word here that's translated either idle or disorderly or undisciplined, he uses the same word in the second letter to Thessalonians. If you look, if you just turn one page, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11. He says, For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busybodies. Again, that word idleness is this disorderliness. He says, there's some of you walking disorderly, so they're not necessarily sitting still and doing nothing, but they are not busy at work, not doing what they should be doing, what God has called them to do, but they are busybodies. An interesting word. Someone who has misplaced activity, disorderly life, busybody, busy with something they should not be busy with. And this is why Paul in verse 12 of that same letter, he says, Now such persons we commend and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. So this is is what Paul is getting on. He says, calm down, slow down, and do the work that God has given you to do. So there appears to be a certain problem, a, a thinking that a quiet and diligent life is not enough or not important enough. Now, there has been a lot of speculation on exactly what may be happening in that church in Thessalonica. Uh, This is, or why there's these busy bodies who are busy with something that God has not given them to do and neglecting their work that God has given them to do. The classic, uh, the classic interpretation or speculation on what might have been happening is that there, there's, there's a lot of 
a lot of talk about second coming in these two letters. And in fact, I'm sure when Paul was there, he spoke to them about second coming of Jesus Christ, that Jesus will return, that they will be with him, they will be taken. And so the speculation is, or the, the thought is that perhaps these people, as they were so consumed with the idea and this truth that Jesus is coming soon, that they have left their work and causing some disturbance in the society, trying to get people to see that the end is near. The sort of like this eschatological hysteria that they, that they had. So this, this is one of the speculation of what is happening uh, and it perhaps may be so uh, but we need to understand that just because Paul does talk about the second coming very often in both of his letters and he does talk about people to be busy at their work that God has given them to do both things are present that it doesn't necessarily mean that one has caused the other just like a and there's B that A doesn't always cause B or when you know when the sun is out more outside it's springtime or summertime and you have allergies it doesn't necessarily mean that the sun has caused your allergies there could be something else perhaps pollen but nonetheless this interpretation that they are so excited about the second coming or have this eschatological hysteria that they have given up work is a very very attractive interpretation and interpretation that has been around for the longest and so I think it has a lot of credibility the main thing here though is that there are people who are busy with all kinds of things neglecting the primary and most important things so how does Paul correct that what does he say remember this is not just Paul's advice this is not just an advice of a psychologist or psychologists who say, based on studies, the best way to live is this way. This is Paul writing a letter to Thessalonians, and this is an inspired word of God that is, was relevant for them then and relevant for us now. And what we learn is that it is through loving people or loving people through a quiet and diligent life this is what brings most significance to our life. It is addressing, in addressing this disquietness of life, Paul starts with love. We have to see this whole section as, as one section together. Verse 9 through verse 12 is one section. Paul starts with, with love and necessity of their love for one another. And he brings it home by saying, so because you love, live quietly mind your own business or mind your own affairs and work with your hands so the whole context here is love uh, and so this is why he he starts off this this section by saying now concerning brotherly love you have no need for anyone to write to you for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another now he uses two different words for love here brotherly love which is philadelphia and then he talks about uh, god's love which is agape so he's he's it's it's a very interesting distinction philadelphia means family love the greeks of the time used that word exclusively to describe love and affection of siblings or family members for one another and paul is saying to them this family like love you know how to love this way because you have learned from God to love and he uses the word agape because God has taught you God taught you to love with his love of affection and love of the will love of a covenant he said you have been taught by God you have experienced this love from God and therefore you can love one another with this brotherly sisterly love family like love so this is a this is a, 
a revolutionary, countercultural thing that Paul is telling them because he's taking the word that is only used in the society for, for, for family love and now he applies it to the family of God. And he says, just like you love God, There's this love within family, natural affection, natural care and concern. Now, this same love must be present in the family of God because you have learned from God. God has taught you to love. Now, how does God teach us this love? He says, again, uh, you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. How is it that God teaches us to love? He does that by giving us a sense of his love through his Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit. So why don't you open with me to Romans chapter five, verse five. I think this passage gives, gives us some light on this, understanding of God's love or experience of God's love, this, this sort of comprehending of God's love. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. God, and then we'll start a little bit later, not from the beginning of the verse. It says, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Again, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The Holy Spirit is the agent that allows us to comprehend, to experience God's love as if this love is now being poured into us. We are filled with this love, the comprehension, the experience of God's love, this learning and experiencing of God's love. And how does the Holy Spirit does, do that? In verse six, the very ve- next verse, it says, for while we were still sinners, or still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. The Spirit reminds us of what Christ has done for us, which he should not have done, which is an amazing thing that he did do. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners Christ died for us this is how we learn God's love this is the greatest demonstration of his love and Paul is saying to Thessalonians and he's saying it to us you've learned of God's love You have the spirit that pours God's love, understanding, comprehension, experience of God's love into your hearts. Now love, and not just love. Look at what Paul is saying here. Uh, He is saying in uh, verse 10, he's saying your love is evident, for that indeed is what you're doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But then notice what he says next. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. He is saying you must love more and more. Love by nature consists of emptying yourself. This is what Paul is showing them. You can never be satisfied with your love because by nature it's emptying yourself. You can never say, I have loved enough. For as soon as you say that, you have stopped loving. This is why Paul says, we urge you, do it more and more. Just like we will never be satisfied, or we will never say, I have understood God's love in my heart or in my life. I no longer need to fill my heart with it. Just like we will never say that, so there will never be a time when you say, I have loved people sufficiently enough. I can stop loving now. Love by nature consists of emptying yourself. And this is important because we in ourselves do not generate love from within ourselves. We must borrow love from someone else so that we 
don't run dry, from a source that never runs dry. This is why he gives them these, this sequence. He says, you learn love from God. Now l- love one another, continue doing it more and more. And this will allow you to have these relationships, beautiful, deep, love-filled relationships with one another. I was reading a, a study this last week the longest study on happiness that was ever done. It was started in 1938 and it's still going. It's called the Harvard Study of Adult, Adult Development. And uh, they, look at, they took a large group of men and they followed them through their lifetime uh, from all the stages of their life, through, from youth to old age. And the main goal is to try to figure out what makes for a thriving life? What makes people flourish? What are the main factors for happiness? And guess what they found? Do you think they found that having lots of money will make you happy? Or that uh, achieving something great in life will bring you this sense of flourishing? What they found is what the Bible has been saying all along for a long time. And that is, they, the study affirmed that there is an absolute primacy of relationships in happiness. People who had the greatest depth of relationships were the happiest through life. Nothing new, right? This is why Paul says, he says, Love one another with this family-like love, with family love, brotherly love. Deep relationships are impossible without love. And love, our ability to love is impossible until we start borrowing this love from the source that never runs dry. And so this is why the first thing, and for us to understand as we talk about what, what, what is it, this, this quiet life of significance that Paul is calling Thessalonians to do? The first thing for us to understand is this love that keeps on giving is what gives significance to a quiet life. This is how Paul addresses this disorderly busyness. He says, Everything you do, including the work that you do, and he will talk about work, including the work that you do with your hands, all of this must come out of your love for people. He addresses the problem from the root. The reason there is disorderly busyness in life is because there is a lack of rest that we find when we uh, the, we, we don't, uh, when we do not experience the love of God and do not love people in the same way. And this, this is what leads us to the next point. As Paul explains the significance of the quiet life, he must, he's making another observation, or we must make another observation. The quietness of life that he's talking about must come from within. Quietness that comes from within. So let's read again a portion of this text that we're studying. Let's start in verse 9, second half of it. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another, for that indeed is what you're doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands. Remember, Paul is addressing a tendency to a hurried and an unnecessary activity. Activity that comes at an expense of the primary things in life, the most important things in life. This is why he says, mind your own affairs and work with your hands. It could have been their excitement about the second coming. It could have been something else that they have been that has been causing this, we don't know exactly the cause of it because we only have this letter. We don't 
We haven't been at their church. We haven't talked to those people. But we do know that when a person goes into a mode of this frantic busyness at the expense of their spiritual depth, there's a certain disquietude of heart that has happened that is causing them to do this. This Greek word that's translated by two English words, live quietly, literally means rest. Have rest. Be at peace. So Paul is saying, aspire, or other translations say, have it your ambition to rest. To have this rest, to be at peace. This rest or quiet life, he's saying, doesn't come naturally. You must aspire for it. You must fight for it, pursue it. The next thing he will say is that you must do your work, but you must do your work out of the sense of rest. You see, there's a certain restlessness that causes this disturbance in our life. It is obvious that there was this type of restlessness present in Thessalonica, these busy bodies doing all kinds of things except what they should have been doing, what God has given them to do. Perhaps it was desire to do something extraordinary for God since he's near. Perhaps it was their lack of rest and the love of God, and that's why Paul is reiterating this, this understanding, uh, this truth of his love that was causing them to think that they, they were not, that they need to do something, something else. Everything we do, everything we do is either from a sense of rest that we find in what has been done to us by God or from a sense of restlessness. Someone called it, someone called this restlessness the eternal inner murmur of self-reproach. Very interesting. As they were looking at their own heart and they said there's this eternal inner murmur of self-reproach. Let's, let's remember as we look at this section, this section actually has started in chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 1, Paul starts a, a new section. And notice how he starts this section. He's talking about pleasing God. Let's read uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the, in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. Now, how in the world can we please a holy God? Sinful people like we are, how can we please God? Well, because we have been accepted by Jesus. This is why Paul says, my goal is to preach the gospel to you. I came to preach the gospel of the one who has made it possible for us to be accepted by God, for us to have God's good pleasure. This is, how, this is how we are able to please Him now that, He says, now that you have been accepted. Now that God is pleased with you through Christ, continue your work. Please Him. Do the works of love. Work with your hands. This is, and this is a very important that this section is, starts with this understanding that it is possible for us to be in a place where God is pleased with us. Not because of our achievement, not because we have finally and ultimately did something great, something so noteworthy that God is finally pleased with us, but because of the gospel that Paul preached. And this is how we are able to have this quietness from within, that allows us to work, this work that comes out of deep sense of rest. And now notice how he said, he says here, and to aspire to live a quiet life and to mind your own affairs literally means 
Do what is your own. That's literally if you translate this phrase. Do what's your own. That is, we accept not only opportunities from God, but we accept our limitations also. God is not asking us to do what he has not given us to do. He has given us both opportunities in life and limitations in life. We accept that from him. You know, sometimes we get so busy, so frantic, so crazy busy, and it's like a fly that got into your house and is trying to get out. This is us often. And it's because we are doing that which God has never appointed us to do, perhaps. Out of our sense of restlessness or out of your sense of restlessness, you try to do more and more as your spiritual life is neglected, as people who are next to you are neglected. It is not a matter of balance, Paul says. It is a matter of the heart. Either working out of the sense of rest, aspire for rest, he says. Aspire for this peace. Or working either out of sense of rest or out of the sense of restlessness. So this is, this is what Paul is teaching us. This is what he's calling us to do. Love, because you have been loved. Aspire for this quietness that comes from within that will, this quietness will spill into your life, into everything you do, everything that God, that God has given you to do. Aspire for that. This is why Jesus said these words. Remember, he, Jesus said, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Jesus talked about this rest as well. And the final thing I want us to look at here as Paul is describing this quiet life that we must aspire to, it is... Do the work that God has appointed you to do. The quiet life is about doing the work that God has appointed you to do. Work that is valuable before God. Look at verse 11. Paul simply says here, after he says, aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs, he says, work with your hands. Very simple. Work with with your hands. Now the Greek culture of that time despised people who worked with their hands. You know, manual labor was for the slaves. It's the philosophers, the artists, they were valuable. They worked with their mind, created things. But in God's value system, the work that was done out of love was good and pleasing to him. This is, why Paul, this is why Paul says, increase in love more and more and work with your hands. There is nothing of lesser value in a work that is done with the hands, primarily with the hands. Paul made tents with his hands. Jesus was a carpenter, most likely. He grew up in the household of a carpenter. He worked with wood with his hands. But do it out of love. Remember, this is what Paul, this is a manifestation of love that Paul is calling them to do. He's urging them to do, to love more and more and work not for status, work not primarily for money, but work out of love for people. Now, I work in a hospital and you know, there's a huge very obvious hierarchy in the hospital. You have the specialists, the surgeons, the brain surgeons, the neurosurgeons, the plastic surgeons, the orthopedic surgeons, then you have the attending physicians, then you have the residents, then you have the nurses, then you have the nursing assistants, and then you have the housekeepers who do the laundry, take the laundry and empty the trash. Obvious hierarchy there. And you could always tell when someone whose position gives them this sense of meaning or significance in life. 
Their status is found in their position. Or someone who, you can always tell when someone is doing what they're doing, not out of, not out of their status or aspiration for status, but doing because they simply love people. You can tell that. It's subtle. It's not always obvious, but you can sense that. When someone is doing their work because they love you, out of their love for you. It's, that's communicated. That bleeds through everything that they do. And so what Paul is saying here, do the work that God has called you to do, whatever it is. If it is your hands, and most, most likely the Christians there, most of them worked with their hands. They were persecuted. Most likely they couldn't even hold the positions of authority for philosophers or artists. They worked with their hands, and Paul says, do that work. And do it out of love because you've learned to love from God. And then he says, if you do that, in verse 12, so that you may walk properly before outsiders. He says that if you live this way, a quiet life that is full of love for people, that is, has this quietness from within, that you do this work, if you do that, Paul says in verse 12, you will walk properly before outsiders. You will be noticed you will not be unnoticed. People will see and sense that there's something in this quiet life, something attractive, something truly extraordinary. And this is what Paul is, is calling them to do. Now, as we finish, as we looked at this short section, as we finish, I want to speak to fathers now. We said in the beginning that it is not some remarkable thing that you will do in your life. Rather, it is the daily, quiet, and diligent work of love that will bring most effect. Fathers, you know, your daily ministry to your children is one of the most or the most important ministry that you will ever do. You know, in 16th century, the, the reformers, they brought back this, this understanding. You know how, how in 16th century, there, there was the priests of the church, the clergy who did the holy work, and there was the rest who did the profane work. The holy work and the profane work. The priests did the holy work for God, and then there were the rest. And what well, the reformers said that there is this universal priesthood of the believers. Because we don't need an intermediary be between us and God. Christ is the only one who brings us to God. Everyone can come with, to God. Uh, everyone is accepted by God through Christ, universal priesthood of believers. We're all priests, and all of our work is holy because our work is done for God. We do our work out of love and for God. Everything is sacred. Everything is dedicated to God, including, fathers, your work with your children that you do instructing them nourishing them, training them. I was listening to an inter interview with a very old pastor, and he was saying back in the day when he had young kids in the house, he would put the sticky note on his dashboard. As he would come to work, to his office, he put the sticky note so that when he would get back in the car after a long day, he would see this sticky note that said, now begins your most important ministry. And this is very true. Now begins your most important ministry at home, your daily, often unnoticed, work of love that you do as you instruct your children, as you speak with them, as you pay attention to them. You know, one of the most simple ways that we love is by giving people attention, giving our children attention, looking at them, listening to them, listening about what, they, what they've done and the things they discovered and the little things that they drew for you on the little paper. All of these things are things that we do as a ministry to God out of our love for Him. Remember this, the same Christ that loves you loves them and you are a conduit of His love for them. 
Why don't we pray right now if you would stand and we would thank, we'll thank God for his love for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your love that we have learned of. We thank you for the spirit that is pouring this understanding, comprehension of your love for us into our hearts. Thank you that you have loved us. You've demonstrated that you have loved the unlovable, that you have sent your son. You have loved the world so much that you have given your only. We thank you for that and that we can learn to love like that. And Lord, I pray that you would teach us the significance of quiet life, a life that comes from a sense of rest that we find in that we have been pleased by you or you are pleased with us, that your good pleasure is on us through Christ. And help us work. Help us work hard. Whatever work you have given us in life to do, help us do it out of love. Help us do it joyfully for you so that you may be glorified. Amen.